All right, thank you uh, guys for joining us this afternoon. It, it was a uh, uh, great to present the Sabre Kentucky Act and the Interim Joint Committee on Judiciary this morning, and uh, we are prepared to take any questions that you may have on that policy. Do you have just a general reaction to how uh, the committee went this morning, some of the comments that you got from your colleagues in the legislature, just general thoughts about that? Yeah, I think uh, the, the comments were uh, supportive. <laughs> Uh, from some and there's some con concerns from others and we look forward to, to vetting out those concerns and, and working with everyone again to ensure that we put forth the the best possible version of this policy for the betterment of Kentucky. And is it correct that the wiretapping provision was removed from this specific bill and will be a standalone? That, that is correct that it was removed. Uh, if we do choose to, to move it as a standalone bill, uh, that, that's still up in the air. I think that that will happen. Uh, I, I'm planning still to, to look into that and, and to lead that perhaps as well. Uh, it's, it's not definite yet. Uh, there was a great question asked actually in the committee meeting today about what the cost of the bill. I know that you mentioned at your initial uh, press hearing about this that you're meeting with the budget committee to have uh, with some people around the budget. Uh, you kind of talk us through that? Yeah, so we, we did have a fiscal analysis done of, of the Safer Kentucky Act, and, and really what we got back was that the, the cost is indeterminate because uh, it's not really known uh, what the impact is going to be um, based on um, who's going to offend and, and so forth. So um, it's indeterminate at this time, but again, uh, like we talked about in committee today, the cost of doing nothing far outweighs the cost uh, of incarceration that could happen uh, as a result of the Sabre Kentucky Act. And real quickly. Yes, sir. So, so I, 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 I'd ask the question, what's the cost of Jake Luxemburger's life? What's the cost of those people that I mentioned who, the 12-year-old who was raped by someone who had committed four previous violent offenses? What's the cost of that young person who had been killed by somebody uh, in Fayette County who had, who had been for, for uh, previous violent offenses? There are scores of those stories. So while it's important that we talk about the cost, no doubt about that, the fundamental responsibility of government is obviously infrastructure, schools of that nature, but also to make sure that pub the public is protected from these kind of violent criminals. And so I think the question is better put. We'll have, our, we'll have the numbers, obviously, to the extent we can get them, but I think the, the question is better put to the p opponents. Um, just how many people have to get killed before we get serious about this? Well, you mentioned also today that there's a lot of uh, data that you've been relying on in making, these, uh, making this proposal. Are you going to be providing that data to us? Are you going to be providing also some specific numbers? You mentioned several specific numbers in your address today. Are you providing the sources for that? Yeah, if that's something that, that is needed, I, I'd be happy to provide uh, anything to anyone uh, that needs it. Kind of about funding, but one of the Democratic lawmakers, I think it was Representative Burke, brought up um, Kentucky's incarceration rate. Um, are you looking at anything that could help with jails funding them for alleviating overcrowding, or is that something that you're kind of taking into consideration with this? It's not at this time, and I don't think that we have an overcrowding issue. Um, so. Um, another concern that was brought up today is the concern about vigilantism, especially when it comes to shopkeepers' privilege and also with the ban on street camping. There are some elements that allow people to kind of take a, in the, like when they're not police officers around, to take it into their own hands a little bit to protect their property or what have you. Is that a concern of yours? How is you plan to address that if not? Yeah, it's certainly a concern. Uh, and, and we're not encouraging that, as Representative Kulkarni said today. That, that is not what we're doing at all. We're, present, we're simply providing property owners, business owners, uh, the ability to protect their property, to protect their goods for sale from experienced criminals that continue to violate the law. Uh, I don't know if Representative Hoshton wants to talk any further on, sure. on the uh, – street camping provision? Yeah, with regards to street camping, <clears throat> uh, there's no provision in there for someone to take action against someone who's camping. It merely says if, if you go out and ask them to move along, take it somewhere else, and they jump up and become violent or threatening that whatever you do to defend yourself is immune from civil and criminal prosecution. Uh, frankly, it's probably covered under the stand your ground uh, laws right now, but this is just to make it crystal clear that you, uh, if someone had the intention of provoking a situation, you know, to, to be grounds for a lawsuit later that protects people from that. And then I also noticed the addition of the housing for, at least I didn't notice it, the original proposal that you guys talked about uh, a month or so ago, mm -hmm. uh, the kind of 
kind of banning housing first initiatives by saying that people must be in a treatment program before they can achieve housing. Can you go over that? How that yeah. fits into the general scheme of safety? <clears throat> well, the ge general scheme is that it just bans state money from going towards a housing first initiative that didn't have a rehabilitative component or a, a complying with the law component. And that's modeled based on what other uh, locales have done and other states have done. Housing first is an abject failure all over America. It increases homelessness, it increases misery, it increases drug abuse and uh, drives the cost through the roof for the taxpayers. So there's got to be at least some minimal step that someone makes in order to get the housing. They've got to agree to, you know, not committing crimes or not using drugs into facility, for instance, like that. Um, right now, the, the housing first model doesn't have that. You can just go into a safe, warm place to use drugs and invite your friends in, uh, compounding the misery for those people on the street. People that are <clears throat> on the street, unsheltered homeless, 70% of them have either serious mental illness, uh, substance use disorder, or both. And those people need to be encouraged to get into treatment because they will it's not compassionate to leave somebody sleeping on the sidewalk for the next 10 years as they go down a slow spiral into sickness and death because they're going to damage not only themselves but a lot of other innocent people with them along the way and uh we've got we've got to we as a society need to step into there and say if you want to live out out in the woods somewhere that's okay but you can't live here in this public place and we need to encourage you to get into treatment you know there are rehab beds open every night and uh if people don't take advantage of that I don't, I'm not sure about rehab beds, but in Louisville, almost most nights, there's a, we get an alert that there's no shelter beds available, you know, on, on a lot of given nights, especially when there's not extended need. Let's say, you know, somebody is banned from street camping, a you know, police officer comes around and says, you can't stay here. Where are they supposed to go, especially if shelter beds? Well, there's a provision in the bill that you'll read the city can designate a spot, say a vacant, vacant lot or a parking lot or an abandoned warehouse as a, as a permissible site for street camping. defense of the, the, the three strikes provision uh, and how it, it pertains specifically to violent felonies. Can you talk about why that's such an important distinction? Because three strikes does kind of trigger a certain thought for a lot of yeah. people who are familiar with how it's worked. Yeah, a lot of the three strikes laws throughout the country that apply to any crime haven't been effective. We agree, I think, with what was said there. But what we're doing here is not that. What we're doing here is we're saying we're recognizing that there are very few people who commit violent crime. But the people who do commit violent crime will do it over and over again. And so we want to address it seriously the first time, no doubt. Uh, if, it's, if it's coupled with drug addiction or so forth, we want to, while we're addressing it and holding them accountable, giving them a bunch of a treatment. But if you do it a series of times, three, we think is a sufficient number, two may be better. If you do it three times, that means what is it? It's commit three violent crimes separately, so it's not on the same time. So three violent crimes you're not someone that we should invest in, number one. And more importantly, you're not someone we can trust to be around other, other peaceable people. And so we're not going to let you rape our 12-year-olds. We're not going let to you, let you kill your neighbors. And so if you've committed three violent crimes, you're going to prison for the rest of your life. We think that is um, the reasonable thing to do because we are trying to protect people who want to be peaceful. Let me address that uh, shop, shoplifting uh, shopkeepers immunity and some of us uh, Susan Witten was part of this group and several other legislators went and visited a Home Depot on Preston Highway in Louisville and the reason they were there is because they were looking for solutions of people just coming in taking a, a cart shopping cart filling it with stuff and just leaving and there's different, many different ways Home Depot is uh, trying to stop that. They have the, the wheels that freeze once you get outside in the parking lot. But they were, they're losing $2 million a year on this, and it's growing. It's been a thing that's growing. It never came to my attention. When I first heard about people going in and just walking, going into Walmart and walking out with things, or Lowe's or, or any place, Walgreens, where they quit giving us carts and Fern Creek hand carts because the guy told me people just fill it up with stuff and walk out. You know, at first I thought, well, that's that doesn't happen very much, but that was like two years ago. I don't know if COVID accelerated this stuff or what, but it is a real problem. And when you're losing $2 million a year, even if you're a big operation like Home Depot, you're getting ready to start shutting do stores down. And, you know, we've got many areas in this state that don't have, 
proper stores, whether it's food, fresh produce, or just Walmarts, across the country, they're just shutting down because they cannot stop this daylight thievery. And it's, it's just a, a horrible situation. And I told Home Depot that, you know, you guys want us to do things like go register people that put uh, items on eBay. That, that's, that's their solution. Take every eBay player or Amazon or anybody with an independent store, and now they're going to have to do another step of their small business to, to take, uh, take precautions to try to stop this thievery that's going on and in, in shoplifting going on in stores. In my opinion, and this is just my opinion, I don't know if everyone shares it, is Home Depot is the first line of defense. Now, I'm not saying a clerk should go tackle some guy that has a gun. I'm not saying that. But there are security measures that they could take. Security guards, man, when I was growing up, there were stores that had security guards at the store, at the door. And there is no reason that these companies cannot take a, uh, a better step of stopping this at the front door, but that's their choice. But my point on this, and I, I think I'm kind of the one that's pushed this at the beginning at least, is that if they make that choice and they have to stop some person that's wheeling out, you know, sawzalls or, or, or uh, drills or whatever in a cart, and they accidentally, in good faith, they're trying to stop that person from leaving, and they accidentally fall and break a leg, and now this guy's being sued because the criminal is suing the store because they uh, broke a leg when they were trying to steal. I think that's terrible, a terrible way for society to operate. There is a reasonable clause in there, and uh, you, you, you can't just, you know, do just be something unreasonable stopping them, but a, a, a good faith effort in stopping them, they should not be punished. And that's why I think that that's in there. Yeah, so uh, the mayor's office, other local governments across the state are certainly uh, supportive of uh, many pieces within the act. Uh, the mayor's office has helped us uh, with some of the policy specifically. Uh, We're going to, to work very closely uh, with his office on the, the wiretapping provision, for example. I know it's not in the bill anymore, but, but as a standalone bill. Um, so, you know, there's in the urban areas across the state, there is... Um, that, that recognition of crime and specifically violent crime is a big problem and people are willing to, to step up and, and take action to support the, the policy that's going to put the train back on the tracks, if you will, because we have completely derailed um, in some of the urban areas across the state. So you mentioned the wiretapping and whatnot. Have there been any other changes to the bill, whether it's other things being removed or other things added since the law was in September? Yes, sir. Uh, that's a great question. We, we removed the provision around the Kentucky State Police Post. That, that's no longer a part of the bill. Uh, Mr. Hoshton brought forward the uh, murder of a first responder uh, provision, which is um, a great policy that he worked very hard on, uh, was very thorough in his uh, study of that issue, and, and put, vo put forth some, some great language on that. So those are a couple of examples. Um, what are some of the challenges? Yeah, I mean, it, that's up to the governor, obviously. It, if he wants to send the message that he doesn't support four and a half million Kentuckians relying on our state government to provide that foundation of public safety, security, and protection, then by all means, that's his prerogative. Um, and so we'll see what he chooses to do if we are blessed to, you know, get a committee hearing in session and, and, and pass the bill. Uh, 